Welcome, everyone. Um, I see numbers of participants are, are rolling in here, so I'm going to go ahead and get the program started. Um, my name is Lisa Schiltz, and I am delighted to welcome you on behalf of the Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy to our discussion today of the uh, very important topic of um, physician-assisted suicide or medical assistance in dying. Um, we have... Um, two marvelous speakers today to share a very, very important and difficult conversation. Um, we have with us John Kelly, who is the director of Second Thoughts Massachusetts, which is a, a, an organization of disability rights advocates against assisted suicide. And he's also the New England Regional Director of Not Dead Yet, a disability rights, national disability rights organization um, that, is, that is active in the same area. We also have with us Thaddeus Pope, the director of the Health Law Institute at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. And he is a, 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 a professional um, and an expert in all kinds of issues of healthcare law and is the co-author of a book called The Right to Die, The Law of End of Life Decision Making and also director of the Medical Futility blog. They, um, you have heard a little bit about their credentials, but I want to share something about the personalities of these two uh, uh, speakers today. And um, I'm not going to mention any other debates that we may have watched in the last 24 hours. But I will say that I've had a number of conversations with these two speakers in organizing this debate or this conversation and in talking through the issues and how we want to present these issues. And I have never in my life had two people who listened so carefully to what the other person was saying and 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 really thought about it in all of their responses to all of the conversations that we had had just in organizing this conference. I think the ability to listen to the other side is extremely important, especially in a conversation like this. So I think I can confidently say that we are going to be in expert hands, expert hands, in working our way through some of the issues that are raised in this um, in the in the in this debate today. We are going to allow first um, 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 Thaddeus to give an opening statement and then John will give an opening statement and then we'll have a moderated conversation where I will pose questions of both of the speakers and they will respond and there'll be some back and forth. After that, we will move to questions from the audience. Um, so. Let me just make one comment to people who are um, joining us who um, uh, should need to know that we have live closed captioning available right now. And to access that from Zoom, you need to go to the bottom of your controls um, where it says closed captioning and then click show subtitle and you'll be able to see those, um, those captions. So with that, I want to um, I want to uh, turn the, the the program over to um, Thaddeus Pope to begin the conversation. Thaddeus, thank you. So this is uh, the only part that I've prepared as a PowerPoint uh, presentation. This is this is so I'm going to do a 10 minute presentation, and then John's going to do a 10 minute presentation, and then as Lisa said, we're going to have an interactive. Uh, Discourse. So I frame this as medical aid in dying. Should it be an option in Minnesota? Uh, thank you to University of St. Thomas for inviting me to do this. Thank you to John Kelly uh, for doing this with me. And I do want to acknowledge um, that it's been a pleasure um, to work with John. We've talked about medical aid in dying um, before. Um, this is us at the uh, National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine. John's all the way on the left. I'm the way all the way on the right. So I guess that, that actually should be reversed, perhaps. Um, we also more recently spoke on this topic together at Harvard Medical School. So it's it's been a pleasure, and uh, this is as well. Um, so let me just give you some numbers, right? During the time of this webinar, uh, Wednesday afternoon, 600 people will die in the United States by the time this webinar is over. Um, 2.8 million people die every year in the United States. 41,000 every year in the state of Minnesota. Most of those people 
want to and do control the timing and the manner of their death. Why? Because they've lost the ability to enjoy activities that are meaningful to them because they fear illness related suffering because they fear losing control and independence. So therefore many hasten their death every day in Minnesota and across the United States. They either stop dialysis, withdraw mechanical ventilator, deactivate an implanted cardiac device and a lot of other mechanisms. This has been long accepted both in law and in medical practice, right? And this is why we have advanced directives, right? Because people get to define the points that they would find their life to be intolerable. We can judge for ourselves what quality of life is acceptable and not acceptable. Made, and I'm gonna call it made, medical aid in dying, what, or what John is calling physician-assisted suicide, made is just one more option. So what is made, right? It's an end of life option that's available for a small number of patients. Which patients, who's it available for? To adults, those who are 18 years and older, who have decisional capacity to understand and communicate healthcare decisions on their own behalf. Nobody can request made for somebody else. You have to do it for yourself. And you have to be terminally ill, which means you have an incurable and irreversible disease that physicians prognosticate will cause your death within six months. And on top of all that, you have to be counseled on your options and alternatives to MAID, um, most notably hospice and palliative care. If you do all that, you're an adult, you're terminally ill, uh, and you've been counseled on your options and you have decisional capacity, what can you get? You can ask and receive a prescription drug that you may, it's up to you if you want to, not everybody does, that you may self-administer to hasten your death. Traditionally, it's been Secanol. The patient would open 90, 100 milligram tablets. That's nine grams. Mix that with something like apple juice. Um, now, it's, it's typically a compounded drug um, of digoxin, morphine, and other things. Um, most patients take these drugs by mouth, so they mix it with a liquid and drink it. Um, but if you have a feeding tube, the patient can press a plunger on the feeding tube to ingest uh, the drugs that way, or they can press the plunger on a rectal tube. Um, however, the mode of administration, the key thing is that the patient alone takes the final overt act. She is the one that's, ca that's, that's causing the drugs to go into her body. Um, but not everybody does that. Um, about a third of the people who get the prescription, so they have the drugs, they're in their house, don't take them. Um, and if you did, this is just one graph. If you see the green line, this is the prescriptions written in Oregon. The green line is prescriptions written in Oregon. The purple line are the prescriptions that were taken in Oregon. You see that's a much lower line. These a lot of people that get the prescriptions don't take them. And that's worth noting because there are really three different populations that benefit from having made as a legal end of life option. It's the people that actually take the drugs because their suffering became intolerable. But it's also other people who have the drugs, they're in their house just in case, um, and they are comforted and they have peace of mind knowing that they're there in case their suffering becomes intolerable, but it, it never does, so they never needed to take the drugs. And then there's other people who never even picked up the drugs or never even got the prescription, but they're also comforted and they also have peace of mind knowing that this is an option just in case. So how exactly do you get the prescription if you're eligible in the ways that I described? There are numerous safeguards to, act, to, to, to access. The patient has to make multiple requests and has to have multiple 
screenings uh, by a prescribing physician, by a second different consulting physician, and even sometimes by a third mental health physician. And what, those, what they're doing is they're making sure that the patient has capacity, that she's terminally ill, and that she understands this option and her other options and is making this choice freely and voluntarily. And most notably, what they're doing is making sure that they're aware of their options for palliative care and hospice care. Almost all patients who get made are already on hospice. Um, and if they are already on hospice, one of the key things that physicians do is reevaluate and redouble the efforts of hospice to make sure that it's doing everything it can to address the unacceptable condition that's, that's perhaps driving the patient to request made. There are waiting periods of 15 to 20 days to assure that the patient reflects and deliberates upon the request that she's making. This is one physician's diagram of all the steps that the patient must navigate in order to access this prescription. I'm not going to go through this, um, but the upshot is this. Those safeguards are designed to ensure that this choice is voluntary, informed, and enduring. And in fact, these safeguards work because a robust amount of evidence shows that medical aid in dying has a solid patient safety record. It started in Oregon. It was the first state to legalize MAID. Uh, that was back in 1994. Since then, that model, the Oregon, what was sometimes called the Oregon model or the Oregon template, has been followed um, in Washington, then in Montana, in Vermont, California, Colorado, Washington, D.C., Hawaii, New Jersey, and Maine. And so as of right now, to this afternoon, September 30th, 2020, one in five Americans lives in a state where medical aid in dying is a legal end of life option, right? If you just add up the population of those 10 states over the total US population. And that's not a surprise, right? Because the overwhelming majority of Americans support medical aid in dying in Harris polls, Gallup polls, and other surveys and polls. So as of right now, as of this afternoon, um, MAID is a legal option in these 10 U.S. jurisdictions. And if you look at how long MAID has been an option in those 10 jurisdictions, right, 23 years it's been, in, it's been an option in, in Oregon, 12 in Washington and so forth. If you add up the years of experience that we have with MAID, we have almost 70 years of combined experience with MAID in U.S. jurisdictions. And we, so we know a lot about it. In that 70 years, we've collected a lot of data, right? Almost every state where MAID um, is an option, the State Department of Health collects a lot of data, demographic data on who's using it, why they're using it, when they're using it. Um, and so we have a lot of data. Here's what we know. Less than one half of 1% of people that die in these states die from MAID, right? So more than 99% of all deaths are completely unaffected by MAID being an option. Who uses it? 76% of people that use MAID are, you have to remember, you have to have a terminal illness. Their terminal illness is cancer. 90% are already on hospice. 74 is the median age. 94% of the people that use MAID are white, and that's even in California where white is a minority. Most of the people that use it are educated and affluent. 95% um, of them are insured, and 73% have had at least some college. So let me just wrap up. Here in Minnesota, like I said, 41,000 Minnesotans are gonna die this year. Most make a deliberate decision to hasten their death, um, either foregoing uh, additional curative treatment or those dependent upon dialysis, vents, clinically assisted nutrition hydration can and do hasten their deaths, right? The 
the concept of equal protection shows that people who are similarly situated, two sets of terminally ill patients, should be treated alike. Right? Every day, terminally ill patients in Minnesota hasten their deaths by withholding or withdrawing treatment. Probably, if you do the math, every 30 minutes. Some patients, though, don't have any treatment to turn off or to refuse. MAID gives those terminally ill, competent adults the same freedom to control the timing and the manner of their death. Thank you. Thank you, Thaddeus. Um, we'll turn now um, to uh, John. Um, who also has a PowerPoint that he is going to uh, be sharing with us. Thank you, Thaddeus, for your opening statement. It's clear that your presentation is persuasive for many people. When we look at an individual in isolation, assisted suicide can seem like an answer. But the lead up to and every death itself is also social. That means we need to consider social institutions like insurers, the family, practice of medicine, but also in our very unequal society, social groups that are privileged, such as the group who's been promoting and using assisted suicide, and then groups that have long been discriminated against by these institutions. The bottom line is who gets treated like a full human and who doesn't. My group is people with disabilities, a group I joined 37 years ago at age 25. As long as I thought of myself as an individual in isolation, in a sea of uh, able-bodiedness, I experienced despair and desolation. But when I found my community of disabled people, I realized my problems came from the ableism within me and the ableist oppression of a society. I learned that my life is valuable and that there is so much work to be done for and with my new community in undoing the effects of ableism. Next slide. Um, I joined Not Dead Yet a few years after its founding in 1996, which was in response to two acquittals of Jack Kevorkian for the killing of disabled people and a couple of Supreme Court cases pending. Kevorkian was promoted by some media as a hero for terminally ill people. But as the New England Journal of Medicine later showed, three quarters of his victims were not terminal, but disabled and usually depressed. A few had no condition at all. Unfortunately, to this day, the media has promoted the falsehood that Kevorkian only dealt with terminally ill people. This is one of the problems faced by disabled people, the conflation or mixing up of disability with terminal illness. We defend disabled people from dis dis deadly discrimination, such as assisted suicide, futility, so-called mercy killing, surrogate decision-making, media messages, and more. Next slide. People with serious illnesses and terminal conditions are disabled. The diagram shows an oval with people with disabilities and a small circle for people with terminal conditions. The uh, people with terminal conditions and people with disabilities are both often referred to as terminal but people with terminal conditions are rarely referred to as disabled. Next, the leading suicide motives reported by doctors in Oregon and mentioned by Thaddeus in his statement revolve around psychological distress about disability, loss of autonomy through dependence on others, 87%, loss of abilities, 90%, loss of dignity, my favorite, loss of self and peer respect because of dependence, 72%. Suicidal despair over incontinence that other people need to assist you with, 39%. Uh, 
the emotional devastation of feeling like an emotional or financial burden on others, 59%. The pain category is nullified because people who experience pain and are afraid of pain have been joined together. Next, please. As the New England Journal of Medicine revealed, it's assisted suicide is about existential distress. A review of a hospital program in Canada found that those who received MAID tended to be white and relatively affluent and indicated that loss of autonomy was the primary reason for their request. And Thaddeus would concur with that. Few patients cited contr you know, uh, control of pain or other symptoms. Now, um, the opposition to assisted suicide is centered in the Black and Latinx and disabled communities who are rightly suspicious of an often hostile medical establishment getting the power to help make you dead. Blacks and Latinx people oppose assisted suicide by more than two to one uh, because of their large turnout in 2012, they effectively defeated the assisted suicide ballot question. And to Thaddeus's statement that 74% of people support made, I would just say that 68% of uh, respondents in a Massachusetts poll two weeks before the referendum said that they supported it. Next slide. The economics of assisted suicide. Assisted suicide makes for a deadly combination with our broken, profit-driven U.S. healthcare system. Insurers decide who gets treatment. I lost two friends in 2019, Carrie Ann Lucas and Bill Peace, because United Health would not give them the treatment they needed and was prescribed. People denied treatment while being offered assisted suicide include Barbara Wagner and Randy Stroop in Oregon, and Stephanie Packer from California, who learned that her copay for assisted suicide would be $1.20. Nevada doctor Brian Callister reported two patients denied for curative treatments by California and Oregon based insurers who only offered hospice and assisted suicide. Derek Humphrey predicted long ago, he's the founder of the Hemlock Society. Uh, the precursor to compassion and choices. He wrote that, quote, economics, not the quest for broadened individual liberties or increased autonomy, will drive assisted suicide to the plateau of acceptable practice. Next slide. Prognostic errors, 12 to 15 percent. The death penalty error rate is estimated at 4 percent. This is often cited by death penalty opponents as a principal reason to oppose. So I ask you audience, if you oppose the death penalty because you can't bear the thought that an innocent person would be killed by the state, why don't you oppose assisted suicide with its three to four times as many potential innocent victims? The answer I think is that while you value the lives of innocent people on death row, that could be you, you don't equally value the lives of people caught up in the death making of assisted suicide with the participation and tacit promotion of death by the state. There are people who would now be happily alive but unfortunately died because they trusted their doctor's pronouncement. You can, be, you can become terminal in Oregon, if you are uh, incurable and irreversible, even if that is based on non-treatment or denial of treatment by insurers. Um, one second. Jeanette Hall voted for the Oregon measure. And then um, when she got diagnosed as terminal, she wrote the Globe in 2011, I didn't want to suffer. I wanted to do what the law allowed. 
and I wanted my doctor to help me. Instead, he encouraged me to try more care. I am so happy to be alive. If my doctor had believed in assisted suicide, I would be dead. Okay, next. How many minutes have I talked? Um, close, to, close to nine. Okay. Um, I would just point out that the values that uh, Thaddeus is uh, promoting are not shared by many people in society. And that you could look at this as a form of, of a culture war in which the opinions of that professional white class is being foisted on the rest of the people. And I'll rest there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both um, for those um, uh, brilliant and, and insightful uh, expositions of the basic foundations of both of your arguments. And we're going to explore them a little bit more now in depth. I have um, some questions that I'll be posing to both of you. Um, and then we have, are we already starting to get a lot of questions from the audience? Please continue to put your questions into the question and answer um, feature down at the bottom of Zoom, and we will have time to get to your questions. Um, Thaddeus, did you have something you want to say? May I just, in less than one minute, just make a brief response to John's main comment? Sure. Which, which is, he's absolutely right, right? This is not shared by many in society. It's absolutely true. Um, the polls show that. Um, but I think it's important to note, it's, it's a completely voluntary option, right? As a patient, if you are Black or Latin, and it's absolutely true that they're far less interested in utilizing this option, they don't utilize, utilize the option. They don't have to utilize the option. And as a clinician, if you don't want to prescribe this, if you don't want to even be a consulting physician, if you're a pharmacist and you don't want to write the prescription for this, no clinician needs to participate in this either. So it, 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 absolutely many don't support it. Many are morally opposed or otherwise opposed. Um, they don't need to, they don't need, they don't need to use it or participate in it. John, did you want to spend a minute or two responding sure. to that? Well, I will, I will try to show in the rest of my presentation that assisted suicide is far from voluntary in such an unequal society where home care is not a guaranteed right, where nursing homes are places where people think they are going to die, where finances are a major concern, and uh, as I said in my opening, um, death is a social thing. It's not just an individual thing. And we are influenced by other people. Completely voluntary choice is a fantasy. And it's not the way the real, word, real world works. Thank you, both of you. I think that was a helpful kind of clarification and distillation of some of the major points of disagreement. And I, I'm confident that we will find uh, opportunities to explore that further as the conversation continues. Thank you. Um, okay, let me just uh, go to uh, one, one, one of my questions. So we had originally scheduled this program for, for, for March 18th, and that was back when the country was just beginning to um, be locked down. Um, and we had to, um, we had to reschedule it to, uh, to, to today uh, to accommodate um, that that the, the reality of COVID-19. Um, the spread of the deadly coronavirus uh, has forced into the public forum a lot of difficult conversations about a host of end of life medical treatment issues. The Office for Civil Rights of the US Department of Health and Human Services has forced a number of states to revise their medical triage plans that were found to discriminate against people with, uh, on the basis of their disabilities. Um, the disproportionate number of deaths from COVID-19 among residents of nursing homes and assisted facilities um, continues, it persists. The death of Michael Hickson, a, a black paraplegic in Austin, Texas, who was refused treatment by his hospital because of his doctor's judgment about his quality of life, um, that made headlines. 
So my question, my first question for each of you is this. Has the COVID-19 pandemic changed the nature of the debate about the legalization of end-of-life medical treatment? And if so, how? Um, I don't remember if we had agreed who would respond first I, to these questions. Uh, John is responding John? to the first one. Okay, great. I think we agreed, yes. So okay. John? Yep. Uh, next slide, please. It says question one. Okay. I think COVID-19 should be the death knell for assisted suicide. It's as if now it would be unseemly to talk about government facilitated deaths in the middle of a death wave. If it's unseemly now, it's unseemly forever and always. States with pending assisted suicide bills just set them aside. The Massachusetts bill, not going anywhere this session either. Older, ill, and disabled people are especially vulnerable to COVID, 200,000 people dead, 40% from nursing homes and congregate facilities, 60% in Massachusetts. That's why we disabled people have been advocating for 40 years that we need a whole new system of care based on home and community models. There is something about COVID-19, something so raw, so deadly, that it's acting like a truth serum for society. Immediately, public health departments scrambled to develop crisis standards of care that would deny treatment to disabled people based on um, ableist notions of survivability, uh, an inventory of organs, and these standards disadvantage disabled people and black people who are more likely to have underlying conditions like blood pressure and diabetes. After pushback by advocates for black people and disabled people, Massachusetts dropped some of its standards but insisted on, five, on holding on to five-year survivability rates. In a settlement with Utah recently, the Office of Civil Rights wrote that, quote, survivability is a factor that can be fraught with speculation, mistaken stereotypes, and assumptions about the quality of life and lifespan of people with disabilities. I'm going to skip to the Michael Hickson slide. Michael Hickson, a black quadriplegic who died in June, was a 46-year-old Texan Morehouse graduate, an auto insurance claim center with five teenage children. In 2017, he had a cardiac arrest and an anoxic episode and brain injury. He had a difficult three years uh, bouncing around from nursing homes and hospitals, and I think he was home at one point. On June 5th, the doctor told Melissa Hickson that they're going to stop treatment. The doctor says he has that Michael has no quality of life. It would be futile to treat him and that it's in his best interest to die. Melissa recorded their conversation. Melissa says, who gets to make that decision whether someone's quality of life, if they have a disability, that their quality of life is not good? Doctor says, it's not me. I didn't make that decision. And, um, you know, that it wouldn't improve his quality of life. And Melissa says, why wouldn't it? Being able to live is an improving quality of life. The doctor discussed a few uh, patients who had survived, but at this point, he said that we're going to deal with what we're going to do, what we feel is best for Michael, along with the state, and this is what we've decided. Melissa says, so the fact that you are killing someone doesn't make sense in your mind? Doctor, we don't think of it as killing. And he says, I would totally do this if this was my mom, my dad, my brother, my sister, my spouse, Melissa, who cannot believe 
that someone would um, basically uh, stop treatment and allow to die someone so close. Melissa says, that's a lie. The doctor says, but what I'm going to tell you that this is a decision between the medical community and the state. No choice for Michael. No one ever asked Michael what he wanted. All right. Okay, I think I think we'll let um, Thaddeus um, okay, have a response, sure and then and then we'll do some 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 more back and forth on the same okay, issue. So good. Thaddeus, so the original question is, is, is has this has the has the COVID nineteen epidemic um, changed the nature of the debate? Yeah. So uh, let me say two things basically. What what is it's not, COVID's not all bad. Um, so it's obviously, there's good and there's bad. So let me just start with the good. Um, it's obviously a big dark cloud, but there is a silver lining. And that's that people are thinking about death. Um, and that's good because that means they're doing advanced care planning, they're completing advanced directives, the rates are way up. A lot of reports show more than 500% up in terms of people doing advanced care planning with uh, their, their attorneys or their healthcare providers. And that's important because advanced care planning helps assure value concordant care. It makes sure that patients get the treatment that they want and they avoid the treatment that they don't want. It's also good that now most states are being very flexible and are allowing uh, the completion of advanced directives through remote witnesses and remote notarization. So this flexibility is good. That should persist after the pandemic. Um, but John's absolutely right. There's a big dark side as well. The triage plans that all states have developed, right, in, in case of a surge situation where there's more patients that need ICU beds and ventilators than there are beds and ventilators to go around. Um, when we have a surge situation, we move from an individual focus to a community focus. We want to maximize the most lives or at least the most life years that we can um, unfortunately, many of these plans carved out many, dis many categories of disability in a categorical fashion and either said you're, you're, you don't get access at all or you get way fewer points in the, uh, in the way that the priority scheme is set up. And those were based not on probability of survivability from COVID, but just based on outright quality of life judgments that it's not worth saving your life. Um, so that that was one instance where COVID exposed something terrible. Um, I actually think that this is a space where John and I stand together. Um, I've written a lot about quality of life bias in end of life treatment, um, not, not made, but, but traditional you know, medical care in the hospital. Um, I'm cited extensively in the, in the new National Council of Disability report on medical futility. I'm cited in a recent Texas appellate court judgment that's, that held that the Texas Advanced Directives Act, which is a law that allows doctors to refute, to turn off life support even over the family's or patient's wishes, that that's unconstitutional. Um, and I was asked to and did consult with the attorneys representing Michael Hickson. Um, what I want to do though is, in the last 10 seconds, is draw a bright line and distinguish all of that from, from medical aid and dying. Um, because when we're talking about triage and when we're talking about medical futility, that is one person making a quality of life judgment about a different person. It's a third party saying that your life isn't worth living. With MAID, with medical aid and dying, it's the individual herself, the one who is living the life who's making the judgment about whether she wants to continue to live that life in a state of serious illness. John, did you um, want to yep, continue sure. the conversation? Um, again, I, I think I want to draw out this term voluntary. When feeling like a burden is one of the main reasons cited by doctors as why people, quote unquote, choose death, feeling like a burden, I felt like a burden, it's horrible. It means that one thinks that one would, people would be better off if I were dead. 
That's the exact thinking in typical suicidal ideation. And it's a mistake. It's a mistake of thinking. But unfortunately, with our healthcare system, people go bankrupt paying for medical treatment and for a nursing home or assisted living. And to sit on a large pot of money, like many of the uh, supporters of assisted suicide do, and wanting to pass that on in a self-defeating way, or having a anxious heir who's ready to receive the money, it means that voluntariness quickly goes out the window. Feeney. Thaddeus, anything more? Um, so let me say two things again. One is, there are risks. I mean, right? I mean, there absolutely is a risk of coercion. There's a risk of duress. Um, that could happen. The problem is, in all the years that we've had medical aid in dying, in all the states that we've had it, there is really no documented case where any of this has ever happened. Um, so, so it's it's theoretically possible, but we, when we make healthcare policy, it really should be evidence based, right, and based upon the best um, data. And experience that we have. And that data and experience shows that these risks just have not obtained. Um, that the safeguards that we have are adequate to mitigate those risks. One of the things that the reason you have multiple visits is those physicians are, are there to make sure. One of the things the laws require is that you meet with the patient alone, right? Outside the presence of the spouse, you know, to make sure that if there's some coercion or duress, you know, the same way we do with domestic violence, we talk with the victim alone, so she'll be more honest and forthcoming. Um, the reason we, we require the referral to a mental health specialist is so we can detect and screen out those people who are suffering from major depression um, or some kind of psych, you know, that, that, it, it, that it's a voluntary, we, want, we have safeguards to make sure that it's a voluntary decision and the evidence that we had shows that those safeguards are adequate to the job. Well, I think that that brings us uh, to the, ne the next uh, uh, larger question. It's, it's kind of transitioning into the next larger question that I want both of you to address, um, which is let's take a more concrete look at the nature of the different laws of the state laws that are out there and the laws that are being proposed um, to um, legalize um, a physician assisted suicide. These laws vary to some degree, but they all contain similar sorts of provisions that on the one hand provide immunity from criminal prosecution for people who participate in administering medical aid in dying. Um, and on the other hand, they provide these kinds of procedural safeguards and restrictive eligibility cri criterion that, that Thaddeus just, um, just, just, just alluded to. Um, newer versions of these laws that are being proposed seem to be changing some of the balance in some of these areas. And the very first state that adopted such a law, uh, Oregon, has recently changed its safeguards. So my question for each of you is this. Can you help us understand the landscape better by, um, by talking about some specific aspects, particular aspects of specific features of the current and proposed state laws that you find most important to illustrate your perspective on the legalization of physician-assisted suicide or medical aid in dying? Um, and this one, I think Thaddeus starts with, right? Okay. So, like I said, Oregon was the first state to authorize MAID back in 1994, and the subsequent nine states have followed that model pretty closely. Um, and that's because the track record was good, right? That's why they followed it. Um, no abuse, um, no involuntary foisting upon the vulnerable, um, Right, and so it's, it, and by the way, this has been super closely watched, right, by the state departments of health, by the state medical boards, by uh, disability rights organizations. Um, and the data, right, that, that the government and that private researchers um, have published shows that the safeguards work. And this is the, the point I wanna make. In fact, this is where we're going. Um, they show that the safeguards are too strong. Um, because there's many terminally ill patients 
who want to hasten her death with maid who are unable to. So for example, they ask late, right? In other words, there's a 15 or 20 day waiting period. They're not gonna last 15 or 20 days. Um, and so that's what your reference was. That's what Oregon did is it said, you can waive that waiting period if the patient isn't expected to be able to survive 15 days, then it's sort of cruel to, have to impose them a 15 day waiting period on them if they don't have 15 days of life left. Um, so that's one way in which we're um, recalibrating the balance between having these barriers or safeguards and also assuring access to those who would find this a desirable healthcare option. Just one other example, in rural areas like in New Mexico and Hawaii, there aren't enough physicians for, for any healthcare service, much less for this healthcare service. So one of the things that bills in those states are doing is to expand the um, prescribing authority uh, from physicians to advanced practice registered nurses or, or, or NPs, nurse practitioners. Um, so in, a, in some, like there is growing variability in the, in, in the bills that you see across the country that are designed to legalize MAID. And the existing states, especially Washington, Oregon, and Hawaii, are reevaluating the safeguards that they already have. If we wanted to, John's right. I mean, if we wanted to be 100% sure that this would never, ever be abused, then we would ban it. Absolutely, we would ban it. That would be one way to assure it would never be abused because it would never be used. But that's not the standard we use for anything in healthcare, much less anything else in the rest of society, is 100% safety. Every healthcare service has side effects. Every healthcare service and intervention has risks. But we offer them because we deem that the benefits of the service outweigh the risks. John? We cannot have 100% certainty in any treatment, but usually the side effect of a treatment is not death when it's mistaken. So they were running a clinical trial for the COVID vaccine and someone had a mysterious reaction. The whole testing protocol was shut down. As I said, 12 to 15% are not dying. And uh, well, I'll get, I'll get into more of that later. I'd like to skip to the uh, slide for question two, depression, which comes out of the bill. Perhaps the most radical move in these bills is the reimagination of depression as a rational response to serious illness. A mental health professional must determine, quote, the patient is not suffering from a psychiatric or psychological disorder or depression causing impaired judgment. The defense of, close quote, the defense of this line of thinking is, you're dying, of course you're depressed, but that's not necessarily true at all. The mental health counselor is tasked with judging whether the person's death wishes are rational, acceptable reasons. And again, I say, if the person says, well, I feel like a burden, I'm incontinent, and I've lost all my dignity. Well, those are all descriptions that can be applied to disabled people. The state must not take a position on whose life is valuable and whose isn't. The, th the reality is depression does impair judgment. That's one of its main features. Ruthie Poole, president of the board of Massachusetts Empower, a statewide group of people with a history of mental health diagnosis, trauma, and addiction, wrote in a Boston Globe op-ed last year that, quote, absolute hopelessness and seeing no way out are common feelings in severe depression. Those of us in Empower are very familiar with the insidious nature of depression. As a therapist once told me, depression does not cause black and white thinking. It causes black and blacker thinking. Absolute hope, oh, 
Uh, personally, as someone who's been suicidal in the past, I can relate to the desire for a painless and easy way out. However, depression is treatable and reversible. Suicide is not. Under these bills, patients are not protected. Self-administration is not a requirement. Nothing set in these laws uh, is, um, involves anything past the dispensing of the drugs. So no, there isn't any close watching. So people can doctor shop until they find that doctor who will prescribe. There's no need to know the patient. There have been doctors who have known people for zero weeks. An heir can be a witness. Doctors who decline to prescribe for medical reasons are not interviewed. Witnesses can simply check the person's ID. They are the only people who certify that the patient's not being coerced. There are reports of doctors who would not prescribe their, pa uh, their patient the drugs because they were depressed only to learn later that they received the prescription from another doctor. The reason these doctors are not interviewed is to suppress any evidence that the prescription was ill-advised. Immunity for all, a main feature of the bill, is that no one need concern about anything outside of the bill's requirements. Persuasion, coercion, and abuse. Kate Cheney was found by a couple of counselors that her daughter was pushing her towards suicide more than herself. Clearly, the daughter couldn't stand dealing with Kate's colostomy bag. When Kate finally was approved, it was for the reasons of if she couldn't get out of bed by herself or manage her colostomy bag. Well, these are disability concerns. I object, I am offended that a state government would take the side that those are good reasons for the state to assist in your death. Catherine Judson. Thaddeus talked about that the interview between the patient and the doctor is alone to avoid um, influence. Well, she brought her husband in for some much needed attention, and then she overheard the doctor making a sales pitch for assisted suicide. Think of what this would mean to your wife, he says. Then we have Wendy Melcher. Uh, showing that violations go unpunished. All the safeguards end with the dispensing of the drugs. Oregonian Wendy Melcher was a trans woman who was terminally ill but was not in the suicide program. Her hospice nurse and another nurse tried to kill her with massive morphine suppositories. But by claiming their act was assisted suicide when it wasn't, they weren't charged with a crime but were dealt in secret by the Oregon Nursing Board. The Portland Tribune wrote, quote, if nurses or anyone else are willing to go outside the law, then all the protections built in the Death with Dignity Act are for naught. Um, Thaddeus, did you have anything that you wanted to, to, um, to add? Let me, or let respond me, to? Yeah, I mean, since this is an academic uh, and, and we're not uh, in an advocacy forum, let me just acknowledge one thing about the depression and impaired psychiatric judgment, because this is a debate that's, that's going on, and so I just want to uh, quickly describe it. The way in which this is screened, right, that the patient may have a psychiatric or psychological condition that's causing impaired judgment, is that if, if either the attending or the consulting physician thinks that the patient may have such a condition, then they need to refer the patient to a mental health specialist to determine whether she does or not. The argument, and this is the debate, this is the debate that's happening, is that that the, the attending and the consulting physician, who may be primary care physicians or oncologists, um, may not have the skills or expertise to determine whether or not the patient does or might have something that's impairing their judgment. And in fact, there are very few referrals 
to mental health specialists. Some people have said that the referral rate is lower than one might expect. So the reaction is what? Well, California, you, um, the law only requires that you see the mental health specialist um, if either the attending or consulting physician refer you there, but some facilities, some individual hospital systems say, no, every single patient that wants made has to have a mental health assessment by a mental health specialist. Hawaii put that into their law. So it's not the, that third visit, that third assessment isn't by referral, it's automatic. Every single patient that wants made in Hawaii must have a mental health specialist assessment. So that's a debate that's happening is, does that, does that help screen out people who aren't making a truly voluntary choice or is it just extra burden, expense and time that thwarts people's access to MAID? And so, and different people have, are speaking to balance that trade off between safety and access mm -hmm. differently. I just want to I, I want to add to this debate now a couple of the questions that I'm seeing in chat that I think are related to specifically the last um, po po point that, that that you have both been debating and one of them um, one attendee points out that there's no mental health referral requirement in Minnesota's proposed physician assisted suicide bill um, if it's so important um, should, should should it be added? Can I answer that? Both I'd like both of you to. Okay. Um, you could add it, but then what happens is that the mental health professional who's from the same, who will almost certainly be from the same social class now promoting and using the program that they are going to use substituted judgment. How can someone decide whether your judgment is impaired when you want to die because you're humiliated by your incontinence? Whereas disabled people have for 50 years been living on our own in the community and directing people to the extent we can of how to deal with our incontinence. But to die because of a, a little poop is, is, is just something that the state should not get involved with. Um, so Thaddeus? I, well, first, I guess it's always important to remember that they're already dying, right? This is the option is only available to people who are terminally ill. So they're already dying. Um, it's, they're only accelerating that normally by a matter of days or weeks. Um, yes, absolutely. I think um, we we need to think about what kind of uh, safeguards to assure that this is a voluntary decision. I mean, look, there's there's basically. Let me just unpack how this works in, in, in one minute, right? You need both the attending and the consulting physician to say that you have capacity and your judgment is not impaired. Otherwise, if either of them says you definitely do not have capacity and that you're not making a voluntary decision, you, you don't get access. So you need them both to sign off. Um, so if either says no, you don't get access. It's only when they're not sure Right? So if they definitely say yes, then you get, you get the prescription. If they definitely say no, you don't get the prescription. The referral is for only that middle category where they're like, well, I'm not sure if it's yes or no. Then the theory is, well, then let's get somebody who, who's a specialist in that to, to weigh in. So I, I, I think that, that that middle category of the mental health assessment, in a case where either the attending or the consulting is unsure about the patient's capacity, yeah, then we should get a third physician to. But just to clarify, in Hawaii, they there it's required in all cases. Hawaii, yeah, it's the only state uh -huh. that's done that. Correct. And in, and in Minnesota, it's not not being required in the in the statute that's being considered in Minnesota. It's not being required at all. So um, I'm going to confess. Um, since the debate is really about, in general, I haven't anchored my thoughts into the specific language of a specific Minnesota bill. Um, but uh, I think, like I said, I think it's an open debate about should you automatically require a mental health assessment for every single patient? Hawaii is the rare exception. All the other state legislatures, hearing tons of testimony, 
looking at tons of evidence, weighing this carefully over a long period of time, all decided that that was not necessary. Okay. So I think that that's a perfectly legitimate option, way for Minnesota to go. Um, I think it's just worth it saying, these, these are very extensively uh, deliberated. In, in, right. in every state legislature, lots of hearings that go on for 10, 12 hours in the House, 10, 12 hours in the Senate, um, lots of floor debate. Um, all those states decided we don't need to do what Hawaii did. So I think I think that's a legitimate option for Minnesota. And if I if I I just want to make sure that I'm correctly understanding John and rephrasing your your position on that is that is that it's just not that much of a protection. It's not a protection because if depression impairs people's judgment. Okay, so then I have a then I have a related question that also from the audience on that question, um, which is I'm um, sorry, Lisa. Could I just oh, respond sure. to sorry. what uh -huh. Thaddeus said quickly? Now he says that they uh, carefully consider people, but again, he he says if someone doesn't get access, if the doctor doesn't think that they're unimpaired, but remember I talked about doctor shopping. Do you remember that? doctors may know the patient for zero weeks. And remember again, that not all the people are dying. He says they have to be terminally ill. If terminally ill were um, a, a, a medical thing, where are the journals? Where are the conferences? Where are the studies trying to improve the prognostication um, percentages? But no. There's a deliberate attempt to squash information which gets destroyed. The, uh, the death certificate is falsified, so there's no way to do investigations. And these public health departments have no funding and no ability to investigate anything. Okay. Um, that is Can I just, sure. just, 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 I mean, terminal illness is, is, in every single state in eligibility criterion, right? So you have to be terminally ill to get access. Um, but you don't, Thaddeus. You don't have to be terminally ill. That's what I've been saying. You have, let me rephrase if you like this. You have to have two licensed physicians say that you're terminally ill. Okay. Acceptable, okay. The concept of terminal illness, um, is not unique to this, right? It's been around since 1983 in the Medicare hospice benefit, right? Most people that die every year in the United States are on hospice. Meaning, and all the people with cancer, which is basically most, almost all the people that use medical aid and dying, get on hospice. And the, and the way you get on hospice is you have to forego all the curative directed treatment. There may have been additional chemo, radiation, surgery. You have to say no to all that and instead go on hospice. When, and they do that when they're terminally ill. So the concept of terminal illness as a prognostic category is widely, widely accepted for millions of Americans uh, every year. Um, and you're absolutely right, of course, that it's not perfect, right? Our prognostic abilities are imperfect. So some people that we say are terminally ill may live for two years and they weren't, they, they don't die within six months. And there's other people who we say are not terminally ill who then die tomorrow. So it's, in, it's it, you're right, it's imperfect, but it's a, it's a commonly, very commonly used diagnostic category. It's commonly used, but there's no scientific basis to it. They find that doctors are, um, if they do have a patient for a long time, they're more likely than not to overestimate how much time they have to live. And that for people from marginalized communities, they may well be judged as dying when they're really not. I mean, we have these health disparities that uh, put the lie to um, any sort of equal treatment and doctors as impartial uh, scientists. Doctors are biased. Okay, thank you both very much. I, I Well, just one small, small. Okay. I just okay. want to say, 
it, it, there's there it, 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 there's not no science with prognosticating terminal illness. The reason why 80% of the people that get medical aid and dying, their terminal illness is cancer, is because cancer is something that we are good at prognosticating on, right? We have stages of cancer. And, and, and I mean, there's just as many people, if not more, who die from heart disease every year. Almost none of them use medical aid in dying, but 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 80 percent of the people that use medical aid in dying are in cancer. Um, but for people because, who because we, there is science for that, but there isn't science for for cardiac and other causes. Okay. OK, I think that we're going to move to a, a, just a different way of looking at some of these same issues, because I want to get to another general question for both of you that, that reflects a lot of the concerns that are also coming up in chat. And then we're still going to have plenty of time to go through the questions that people are posing. And so some of these issues, you have been focusing very much on the effectiveness of the protections versus the ineffectiveness of the protections that are built into the bill, which is, has been a very helpful from both of you. Um, you know, clarification of, of what's at stake here. So, but but I think that's I think the the discussion about that balance is going to be it's going to come up later in some of our questions. So I want to move to the last question that that I want to pose for both of you, um, which is it has to do with the social impact of the legalization of medical aid in dying. Um, is an act of physician assisted suicide a personal private act that deserves legal protection as being properly made? by the individual and his or her physician? Or does the legalization of medical aid in dying have broader social impacts that ripple beyond the participants in the individual decision into larger public policy concerns about the public investment in health and home care, suicide contagion, and insurance industry norm shaping? And John, you start the response to this okay. one. Okay. I'm going to skip to the slide for question three, social impact with the chart of uh, approval and disapproval. So opinion on laws to allow doctor-assisted suicide by race ethnicity, Pew Research Center 2013. White people, 53% approve, 44% disapprove. In wealthier areas, like in Massachusetts, say in Newton or Amherst, very high in favor, as high as 80% in some towns. Uh, Latinx people opposed by two, two to one, while black uh, respondents opposed by 65 to 29%. Polling that shows overwhelming support for assisted suicide often rely on a formulation of someone dying in pain. And pain, as we see, is not really a factor. Now I'm, sh the next slide, please. This map, I'm sorry, it's not, oh, it's the class divide map of uh, Massachusetts. Oh, it's not there. Oh, there it is. Um, so what we can see at this map, if people know Massachusetts at all, is that uh, wealthier, liberal, whiter towns supported by heavy numbers and poorer towns, uh, more with minorities, heavily opposed. Lawrence, which is uh, very highly um, Latinx, opposed by uh, 69 to 31%. Chelsea opposed, Holyoke opposed, the four most Latinx cities in the Commonwealth all voted heavily no, while whiter, wealthier towns voted heavily yes. It's important to also note that working class white towns also voted against. This is in many ways a class divide and because proponents are in the dominant position as opinion makers, which gets amplified by those same class, uh, professional class people in the media, that we end up with, it looks like a social consensus when it's anything but. The impact on the black community is especially pernicious because black people already have a well-deserved mistrust of medicine 
and the racial disparities that continue to be um, propagated. So black people are 13% of the US population, yet represent 23% of coronavirus deaths. COVID-19 has laid bare racial disparities and disability discrimination. I'd like to uh, cite the work of my friend and colleague, Anita Cameron, and here you, oh, uh, Anita Cameron, slide please. Uh, there should be a, an, mm, there should be a photo right before that. Uh, go down a bit. Go down, go down. Oh, okay. Well, I'll just uh, describe. Um, you could take that slide down. Thank you. Anyway, I had a picture of Anita Cameron. Oh, if you could take that down also. Thanks. Um, I have a picture of her aiding, holding an aid in living, not dying, not aid in living, not aid in dying. She's a black woman with long locks. And um, in a recently published letter to the Boston Globe, she wrote, whereas a white person writing an editorial would be able to get good care she says she is not confident of that. She says, I want to be able to live. I want my conditions effectively treated and I want effective pain relief. But while uh, Martin Yeti might assume he'll get good care, black people like me tend to receive inferior care because of racial disparities in cardiac care, diabetes and cancer. Black people like me with chronic pain avoid the emergency room because we're treated like drug addicts. Black people, particularly women, get sent home to die because we are not believed. And the immediate spillover effect of these laws is that it puts into circulation the belief that people with some conditions are better off dead. So if a doctor just prescribed uh, lethal drugs, to someone who complained about incontinence and not being in bed and being in bed, and they come upon someone with who is incontinent and can't get out of bed, and like say Michael Hickson, they don't even think they need to ask him because he was intellectually disabled. So it will mean that um, people, that disabled people and older people may be constructed as having a duty to die, like the statements during COVID that the economy is more important than people's lives. We have to look at the social context for everything and remember that the state is putting its thumbs on the scale on behalf of a powerful uh, minority in the state whose beliefs in autonomy and uh, achievement are are contradicted by Black, Latinx, and poor people who believe that family and connection is what's so important. Thank you, John. Um, Thaddeus? I, look, um, I don't know if the, the populations that um, the poor African Americans, if they are feeling a duty to die, but uh, but I tell you, that has nothing to do with medical aid and dying because we have a robust amount of data. You can go to the Department of Health reports, all collected on the Oregon Department of Health website, the Washington Department of Health website, the California Department of Health website. There's no evidence that this is uh, being used against. Um, minorities or, or the vulnerable or, or poor people. Generally, they aren't using it. So if they, if they do feel a duty to die, they're not feeling a duty uh, to use medical aid in dying as an option. So like I said, in nearly 70 years of combined experience with MAID across 10 states, no evidence um, that this has been um, foisted upon 
uh, those populations. I'm not denying that they have, that there are disparate outcomes, there's, there's, there's biases, uh, and there's lots of problems in the quality of care that they get versus the wealthy white Americans. A that's absolutely true. Um, but, it's, but what's not clear, and there's no evidence to establish, that that connects to and relates to usage of me. Thaddeus, do you want to add to, a little bit to your response? The, the first part of the question, um, and some of the chat questions are, are, are asking for some articulation of this too. Is an act of physician-assisted suicide a personal private act that deserves legal protection as being properly made by the individual and his or her physician? So one of the chat questions was, is, 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 is the right to um, um, a physician um, to a medical aid in dying, should it be seen as a civil right? Yes, um, it is. I mean, that's, that's the way it's framed. And that's why when I, in my opening presentation, I said we already allow people to control the timing and manner of their death. Um, right? If you, there's many, many people who have end-stage renal disease, hundreds of thousands, 20% of them stop dialysis, even though they're not getting a kidney transplant. So without dialysis, they're going to die. 20% say, the burdens of dialysis going in two, three times a week for dialysis, I don't want it. It's going to keep me alive for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, but forget it. I don't want to live like that. They may make that choice. They do make that choice. Um, and that is a civil right. Um, and I think that this, this, is, this is in the same continuum, right, of, of the right to control the timing and the manner of your death when you have a serious illness that gives you conditions that you, that you find intolerable, right? I, I really think that the Michael Hickson type cases are completely inapposite because that is somebody else. That was um, a doc, a physician who was biased, apparently from the audio, who, who thought that Michael Hickson's life wasn't worth living, right? It would have been very, very different if Michael Hickson made that decision for himself, but that's not what happened. We're talking about people making decisions for themselves. So I think it, it, yes, it's a private decision between a patient and her physician, um, and, and, it's, and it's a civil right, just like the right to uh, refuse other healthcare services. John? I think we have to acknowledge that every so-called personal decision occurs in a context of other people. And if people around you think that your life is not going to be worth living based on the uh, cultural ideas that certain conditions are better, uh, are worse than death, and we see this constantly, I could be a poster child for uh, better dead than disabled. Just look at the movies like me before you. And Thaddeus talks about individuals making individual decisions, but for disabled people and marginalized communities, we experience all these things at once. So if I, when I was in the hospital with necrotizing pneumonia, the doctor asked my brothers about my quality of life. And it's impossible to extricate quality of life from the assisted suicide programs. And for the prejudiced views of one social group, wealthier, whiter people, to impose that on the rest of the, of the state such that um, we keep seeing the uh, numbers of assisted suicides going up and um, I'd also like to say that there is a huge difference between stopping treatment and getting assisted suicide. Stopping treatment is an individual decision. Getting assisted suicide is a state program that enables people to get assisted suicide if they're unhappy about their disability. And we say that we deserve the same level of suicide prevention services as everyone else. Um, suicide prevention organizations run also by this same social group promoting it, 
they take no position on assisted suicide. And, uh, well, I'll, I'll, you know, and, you know, to, to believe that, you know, people, you know, with us, with state's approval, dying because they are incontinent or because they can't uh, use boats anymore or go skiing like a couple in, uh, in Maine who killed themselves outside of uh, any program. You know, it just, it's very terrifying for us to live in a society that if we go to the hospital, there will be people there thinking, well, this person really might be better off dead, like the doctor and the hospital in Austin, which decided that Michael Hickson's death would be in his own best interest. And that the chief medical officer of Austin, that Austin hospital said that, uh, oh, intubating someone could be, could cause suffering and no one wants suffering, but I was intubated three times. I loved that intubation because it kept me alive. And it was very touch and go. People would not have been surprised if I had died. And if I'd gone to a hospital with heavy bias against me, or if I were black or Latin X, or maybe because I wasn't uh, such a, a good speaker, well, all sorts of things go down. Fabius, one, one last response, yeah. and then I'm going to start asking some of these questions that are wonderful yeah, questions see, coming into the see, audience. Yeah, I see a whole bunch, dozen. Mm -hmm. uh, John referred to, the, to, to medical indicting as a state program, um, which, you know, it's not, right, because it's, it's just private physicians um, that, that, that are uh, participating. But, but I want to just note that, that he's saying it's abhorrent that the state would have a program that would facilitate this. You know, it's equally abhorrent right, for the state to be paternalistic, right? We've rejected that time and time again since the, since, uh, the beginning of the democracy, right, that, that, that the state would say, we don't trust you to make decisions for yourself. We don't trust that you know what's in your own best interest. You might make a bad decision here, um, and so we're just not going to let you make it, right? So that kind of paternalism um, is, is equally abhorrent. So I just want to note that it, he's saying it's, it's, it's abhorrent for the state to facilitate this choice, but there's, dis, there's disabled people advocate for this, like Stephen Fletcher, member of parliament in Canada, and the people who are quadriplegics who are advocates for medical and dying. There's entire disability rights organizations that support medical aid and dying before state legislatures. So um, I just want to make sure that we acknowledge that there are other disabled individuals and other disability rights groups that think that they should have this right. And so I'm going to start with a comment from somebody who represents uh, the perspective that you just um, that you just um, that you just invoked, uh, Thaddeus. Um, uh, I am a severely disabled individual living in Massachusetts and think that Mr. Kelly's contention that issues other than pain are not valid issues to elect to use made, such as not wanting to be a burden in others, not finding meaning in the limitations in their terminal illnesses put in their lives, not wanting a significant financial expenses to their families. All of these issues are extremely important to me. Um, uh, and, 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 this, and this individual said, I'd like to remind Mr. Kelly that no um, disabled person can elect to use MAID unless they are an adult, mentally competent, deemed terminally ill. Um, and there are some other questions along that same uh, line. Um, I, I, um, let me just find this one. Um, why is it not okay for my husband to feel a loss of dignity with a loss of incontinence when he had a prognosis of three to four months? It's what he felt. If he had a prognosis of 15 years, he would have embraced it and moved on. Um, so, um, so and, there, and there are a couple of other questions in, along those lines um, um, from the audience. Um, um, and um, what would you want to say about that, those, John? Well, um, people who feel a lack of dignity because they're incontinent, those are their feelings, that's real. 
The problem is that the state is getting involved. The state is saying it's a rational decision to feel lack of dignity um, at incontinence. And as someone who's incontinent, I have learned that it has nothing to do with my dignity. We have a disagreement and the state is putting its thumb on the scales by saying that every by saying that anyone who participates in this making dead is immune from any kind of investigation or prosecution. So I would say to that gentleman in Massachusetts, he can do what he wants, but for the state to say, yes, we're going to give a civil right to people that if they're incontinent, well, here, let's, let's give you some drugs and, uh, and you go about it. And all the possible um, influence of other people, you know, if someone feels like a burden because of financial reasons, well, the state should be saying, wait a minute, there's something wrong here. Let's do everything we can so that this person can feel dignity. And, um, you know, dignity is a term that's really only used by the demographic group proposing these bills. Other groups, to say, uh, some disabled people, black and brown people, they see connection and family as what's important. Michael Hickson's wife, widow, said that, of course he would have said he wanted to live. He lived for his family. And I recommend that people watch the YouTube video, I think it's called Michael's Apoxia and Brain Injury, in which you can see him enjoying his family. And for the state to say, um, no, you know, people like you, your quality of life is terrible. Maybe we're going to stop treating you. And again, we're talking about involuntary cessation of treatment. And I want to say that the difference between stopping treatment and getting assisted suicide is a, a huge gulf. Uh, supporters have been trying to elide or uh, eliminate the difference between the two, but assisted suicide involves the state authorizing a doctor who gets immunity, who uh, prescribes the drugs, and then they go into the home where anything could happen. That is? I'll be brief. John, right, in response to his neighbor in Massachusetts who wrote, who wrote the question, John said, he can do what he wants. And that's the, that's the whole gist of it, is because he can't. Because I'm inferring from the questioner that what they want is a peaceful and comfortable death, right, from, through medical aid and dying. And they can't get what they want because the state of Massachusetts has made that a crime, right? So it's not, it depends, it's a framing question, right? Is the state of Massachusetts thwarting is it getting in the way or is it or is it facilitating all he wants is for the state of massachusetts to get out of the way right he's not asking for affirmative support um or anything like that he just says just decriminalize it because as of now you the state government of massachusetts has inserted itself between him this this questioner and his physician and he's, all he wants is for the state to get out of the way i would say that um you've you've turned that on its head the state gets involved by approving of the person's reasons for wanting to die and giving the doctor immunity by prescribing this. Now, if someone wanted to die because they felt that um, uh, extraterrestrial beings were assaulting them and trying to kill them, well, they probably wouldn't be seen as rational. But as long as the formulation of uh, that it's rational for a person to feel lack of dignity over incontinence, then we are instituting massive prejudice against people who live with those conditions. 
that seems self-evident to me. And I don't understand how people can say, oh, it has nothing to do with disabled people. When it's all about disability, all the reasons are about disability. That is? Well, I mean, they are. I mean, I, I guess that's, I mean, that, that's worth conceding, I think. Um, the re, they are all about, I mean, his diagram, where he had the two Venn diagrams, right? Everybody who's terminally ill probably is definitionally disabled, right? So if you have metastatic terminal cancer, you're disabled. Um, so everybody who's using medical aid and dying is disabled. And, and probably you could go the next step and say, the reason they want medical aid and dying is because of their disability. It's because of the cancer or the side effects or, or the conditions from the cancer. So th that's, that's a true statement, but I guess the key thing is that's their judgment, right? Some people are, would say, I don't, I find this condition intolerable. And people won't. Uh, Okay, so let me let me pursue this um, this from an, um, the a, a, a suggestion by another one of the um, of the of the listeners here. Um, as we talk about side effects or the philosophy of double effect, it seems that the distinction between the harmful result in the pursuit of the benefit gained is being either ignored or conflated, as the benefit aimed at by made is the harm itself. Thus, when we make suicide a public good to be pursued, the conventional ethical calculations can become meaningless rather quickly. It would seem more fair to argue the nature of the act itself, as it is the nature of suicide that is being debated. So, when, whether suicide can earn the redefinition as a public good seems to be the driving issue and doesn't seem to benefit from comparisons with other medical treatments designed to prolong death, life, and delay death. And this also goes to some of the comments that I'm seeing in the, in the chats and the, and the question and answers, which is about the terminology that both of you use. Um, with John, it's um, a physician-assisted suicide, and with Thaddeus, it's medical aid in dying. Um, and this questioner is, is, is sort of getting at the legitimacy of that redefinition um, on both sides. So... Um, uh, would either of you, I think it's Thaddeus's turn to start. Okay. Well, first of all, I didn't realize we were going to let philosophers into the Q&A, but <laughs> this is going so much better than the Trump-Biden debate. Uh, so I was waiting for that line. <laughs> but I'll, I'll start yelling if you want me to. Um, Please, no, I will not. I'll, I'll shut you <laughs> off there. I'll mute you. This, right. That's the benefit is you can mute me. Uh, um, so let me take let me two two steps. One is etymologically, conceptually, yeah, it's suicide, right? But then so is turning off events. So is having a DNR order. So is deactivating an ICD. So is stopping dialysis. We don't call any of that suicide when patients make those decisions. Um, and there's two reasons why we don't call any of that stuff suicide. One is legal, and one is sort of a colloquial. So the legal reason is every state has a statute that says withholding, withdrawing, refusing life sustaining line. is not suicide. Um, and made statutes do the same thing. So made is is by statute defined as not being suicide. So that's a legal reason. Colloquially, look at you, right? We suicide is when the cause of death, um, when it's a patient that's not already dying, and when we think it's tragic. Um, in contrast, the 5,000 plus people who have used MAID in the United States, they are already dying. They were actually pretty close to death. Um, and they made a conscious delay. Except for those people who aren't. Let's, let's take yeah. turns on this, that is. They made a voluntary decision. In a, well, let me just wrap up, right? See, Suicide is now often used in a normative sense, not in a descriptive sense. So it's often used to describe deaths that are thought to be bad or undignified or that shouldn't be allowed, um, that should be prevented. We should prevent suicide, right? So that's the way in which we colloquially use suicide. But that's, it's inappropriate to call made suicide because those are deaths that the people that asked for it um, 
think are dignified, they wanted those deaths, and they think it should be an option. John? But that still makes it suicide. Um, compassion and choices went around the country oh, 10 years or so ago, um, suing the states and saying that uh, aid in dying is already uh, legal because it's a different procedure. And, and the judge who ruled against it said that in 1994, there was a bill creating an exemption for doctors to prescribe lethal doses, and it was called an act concerning physician-assisted suicide. But as we know, suicide's kind of a downer from a marketing perspective. So the next year, the same bill with the same language with a new title appeared in the legislature, and it was called an act concerning um, death with dignity. And so we see, you know, the reason that there's so many different names for assisted suicide is because people are trying to avoid the phrase. And as the, the judge ruled, suicide for a sympathetic reason is still called suicide. And proponents who say, oh no, um, it's actually the disease that's killing me. You know, that uh, you know, that so the death certificate is falsified, that um, I, I'm not dying, the, the, the thing is killing me. But again, many people are not dying. People are losing months, years, and decades. Every year in Oregon, at least one person has outlived the six-month diagnosis. One person lived 1,009 days. And, you know, many people know people who have been diagnosed as terminal who did not then die. Okay. Um, just, there's, we, we use words in different senses, right? And so John's point about the litigation, to be fair, there were, there were cases in New Mexico, New York, and even Massachusetts, all, all of which criminalize assisted suicide. Right? One person may not help another person hasten their death. That's a, that's a criminal felony statute in almost every state. And the, and the nature of these lawsuits was to say, oh no, medical aid in dying is very, very different than what was anticipated when this criminal law was designed. Um, and therefore it's not suicide. And, I, and I'll concede to John's point, every one of those cases went up to the state's high uh, court and, and every one of them lost. So. Everyone said this is suicide, at least as far as the, the felony statute criminalizing assisted suicide, that criminalizes medical aid to dying. Um, so from a pure statutory sense, it's been considered suicide. I think, as I said, conceptually it is suicide. It's one person ingesting a lethal substance that causes their death. That is the definition of suicide. But I think that we have to think about how words are used in society as well. And suicide has a pretty negative connotation, but the people, both the clinicians and the patients that participate in MAID think that they are doing something good. They're taking control and they are um, helping achieve a comfortable, peaceful death um, as opposed to the death that they foresee that they were gonna have. So they don't view it as a bad thing at all. They view it as, as a positive, as a benefit. I would just say that, you know, Thaddeus says there's no other way for these people to gain control, but VSED is legal everywhere, voluntary stopping of eating and drinking, and they will make you comfortable during that time. If that were, uh, that is legal, we don't need to have assisted suicide on top of that because some people don't want to wait a long time, but the dangers to society, the biases that are upheld and propagated on marginalized community make these bills too dangerous to pass. And again, it's just one social group who's pushing for this. And I would argue that this uh, over-concentration or even fetishization of ability and achievement is I would call that a 
a problem for this demographic. You know, when, when big things happen, people will say, oh, we get reminded of what really matters. And what really matters is each individual in the social grouping they're in, um, their connection, their family, and um, these bills are not uh, necessary because of visa, and they are very pernicious in promoting prejudice against disabled people, um, promoting bias against marginalized people, and it's because uh, this social group won't listen to anyone else in society who says, that everyone has inherent dignity. It's the foundation of a democratic society that every person must be equal before the law. And that means that each person has within them inherent dignity that is worthy of protection by the state from coercion and from persuasion. I mean, that gentleman in Massachusetts who says, well, what's wrong? with wanting to die because of financial reasons. Well, I would say I think it's up to the state to take that problem away from people. That's why we need a guaranteed home care benefit so we take finances out of it. Let's work on bringing society together rather than pulling it apart. Let's, um, I, want, I want Thaddeus to have a chance to respond really specifically to what I think is a, a new a new idea. A, a new concept that's come up that that the um, um, that John just raised, which is the um, that v because every op there is an option right, right for everybody to, ha to hasten their death by 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 stopping to eat and drink. So um, w why is that not um, um, why is why do we need legalization of physician uh, so, of medical aid? So VSC, so basically the idea of VSC voluntary stopping and drinking V said VSCD. Um, is that you, you completely stop drinking, right? And you'll die from dehydration in 10 to 14 days. It, a lot of people use VSED to hasten their death. Um, one thing is it, it, it's actually kind of difficult, right? Because the, 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 the feelings of thirst are, it, it's not as comfortable a way to go as MAID, which is a, a quicker way to go. If once you ingest the MAID medications, you will become unconscious very, very quickly um, and then die after that. So VSED, you have to, against the feel, overwhelming feelings of thirst and, and other symptoms of dehydration, uh, you have to persist through that. So it's a little bit more difficult of an option. My, um, my bigger concern, I guess I want to, if I can, just throw this back to John, is um, if you're concerned about people hastening their death from incontinence and you're going to take the mate option away from them, what about all, all, don't all the same concerns about people in, you know, being motivated by um, bad reasons, that you, it seems that you would want to prohibit VSED um, as well, right? All the people who you're concerned about that um, are, you know, motivated by incontinence or reasons that they shouldn't be motivated by, they can't, under your world, use MAID, but, but it seems that to be consistent with your concern about protecting them from uh, coercion or bad decisions, that you would also want to take VSED away from them as an option? No, I wouldn't because that's already the law. And with VSED, you don't have the state coming in and making a pronouncement in favor of one view of human dignity and against the view, the democratic view, that everyone has equal dignity. And so um, VSED is legal and it doesn't impact other people um, like the way that a law does, which promotes the idea that being disabled is a fate worse than death, which is ratified throughout society based on you know, the fact that many people can't live at home and they, be, they may become suicidal. Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna sure. stop because I wanna get at least one more of these audience questions in before we move to your final remarks. Okay, so one of the questions that's asked was that um, what was initially the individual right to refuse treatment, right, which is the analogy that Thaddeus is making to, to what's going on here, it, it, it became a right of surrogates to decide for you. 
and a right of doctors to refuse treatment under futility policies. What would stop MAID from evolving in that same way? And one of the other questioners asked, for example, what, how would you apply, Thaddeus, this, Th th this idea, um, uh, you know, the, uh, if there's an evolution to, to a decision of a parent of a young infant who was absolutely convinced that the infant was in horrible pain and was going to be dying within a month and has been told by every expert. What would stop the made decision from evolving into a decision that surrogates could make on behalf of people? Well, so the most obvious thing is you'd have to go back to the legislature to actually, you know, enact that law, right? So it's the democratic process is the main, is the main thing. Um, it's worth noting um, that in no jurisdiction on earth um, do we allow that. We, in some jurisdictions, so in the Netherlands, you can make an advanced decision for yourself. Um, and that might be most notably for the case of dementia. So because by the time you get into late stage dementia, you're not gonna have the capacity to ask and receive and consume this drug. So you, you, while you still have capacity in early stage of dementia, you say, when I get to this, in a few years, when I get to this other state, I don't wanna live like that. So that's when I want you to, to do it to me. Um, but that's still, that's the person, right? Writing and making in it what we call an advanced request um, in the future. Um, so that's in the Netherlands. Canada is talking about that. Um, but really, we, what we, nobody's allowed is one person deciding that somebody, again, that somebody else's quality of life is inadequate, and therefore we should take active measures to end that life. Um, so there, there, it's, it's not happened, right? In any, any other jurisdiction on earth, we, we, we've not crossed that line. Um, and the background right to all of this in Minnesota, for example, and in Massachusetts is there's a felony assisted suicide statute, um, which means any additional option needs to be affirmatively legislated, uh, which is sort of John's point, which is the state's imprimatur on this. Um, so th that's the safeguard. Okay, John, do you wanna to respond to that? And then we'll sure. move to your final remarks. Well, we have futility and futility is uh, say in Texas, a hospital saying that it is futile to treat you because it's not in your best interests and uh, we don't think that you, your quality of life is worth preserving. And Michael Hickson, who was not treated outside of the futility law, but it still came in that language. And that's what people fear. You know, they're, they're, before the uh, ballot uh, election in 2012, there were stories of, you know, a writer named S.I. Rosenbaum who uh, went to the hospital with her boyfriend. He was a vet user because he aspirated some pineapple and they were in the middle of getting ready to go to a club and she starts hearing that, well, maybe it would be better for him to die. Maybe that would be for the best. And when you talk, of, when you make uh, assisted suicide a medical benefit, a medical treatment, you can only extend it to more and more populations. And that's the only two jurisdictions where assisted suicide um, is not open to disabled people is the UK and the US, which have vibrant disability rights um, organizations. In Canada, now the disabled can use it because the language is the same. And in the recent Globe article about death and dying, they asked questions like, if you were, had an incurable disease and were totally dependent on others, should doctors let, stop treating you and let you die? Well, that's directly at me in my life. And again, we get that conflation or mixing up of, um, I lost my train of thought, of uh, disability and terminality. 
Okay, well, let's, let's now, um, we're coming to the end. There are so many questions that we could have asked and, um, but we just didn't, didn't have time. Um, um, so let's, let's give um, Thaddeus and then, and then John each a chance uh, to spend five minutes with a closing statement. Thaddeus? Thanks. So for 50 years, we've recognized in law and in medical practice that different people value different states of living differently. Right, that's why we have advanced directives. So each of us can define the points or the states of serious illness under which we would not want to live. Absolutely, we must protect the vulnerable, but we don't do that by taking away their liberty, right? Look at guardianship jurisprudence, right? If an elder has capacity, we let her stay in her own home if that's what she wants despite the risk of her falling down, despite the risk of her starting a fire in the kitchen, right? We could prevent those risks by putting her under guardianship and taking away her liberty. We don't do that, right? We reject paternalism. Most of you have insurance for your car, for your house, just in case, just in case something bad happens. Made is like insurance. Hospice and palliative care is almost always sufficient to treat physical and existential suffering of the terminally ill, but not always. Made is like an insurance policy, just in case. Most won't need it or even want it, but it's there for those who do. Thanks. Thank you, Thaddeus. Um, uh, uh, John? Well, I would say that um, if MAID is like an insurance policy, then why not offer it to everyone? Because, you know, we will see that depression, uh, it's freestanding, is something that people are arguing for. People are arguing for advanced directives in which a younger person can decide the fate of an older person, maybe against the will of that older person. So I really want to draw attention to the fact and to the, to the part of assisted suicide laws that are not voluntary. And again, for the state to say, oh, well, you want to die because you're disabled? You want to die because you're disabled? That's good. That's fine. Those are rational reasons to kill yourself. And I say um, it's very frightening for populations to see that the state is approving suicides for people who are just like us but have psychological distress. So um, um, you know, again, when you make doctor prescribed suicide a new medical treatment, it's a benefit that will be extended to more and more people. And once that line is crossed of making that a benefit, a social good for someone to kill themselves because of their disability, we ask, are we not eligible for suicide prevention services? Why is the first assumption always that, oh, we want to die be because we're disabled, you know? And the, uh, the, the stereotype of people like me who want to live and don't want the state getting involved in personal decision making, you know, we say, hey, how about equal treatment under the law? a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act to deny, withhold, or derogate uh, suicide prevention services for people with a certain kind of psychological distress. Um, how about if we work together to make sure that home care, 24-7 home care for people with Michael Hickson is available and fully funded, regardless of means, a health guarantee, also to make sure that palliative care is available and that palliative doctors get prestige. 
And let's listen to different people for a change, to black people terrified to go to the ER, to black disabled people who experience the intersection of ableism and racism, to people with intellectual disabilities who also love their lives, but are now at risk for DNRs, do not resuscitate orders, being put in their files. And everything um, we can't isolate out individual actions and say that that's not going to have any impact on um, on the rest of society. If these bills get passed, some people will lose their lives through insurance denials, persuasion and coercion and all forms of abuse, misdiagnosis and wrong prognosis, through depression, through racially biased lack of care and denial of care exacerbated by quality of life determinations and which can never be undone. Thank you. Thank you very much, both of you. I want to thank um, both of you for um, a beautiful counterpoint uh, to um, another debate that took place last night um, is a thoughtful discussion of an incredibly difficult issue. Um, I hope that everybody in the audience has learned as much as I have um, from not just the um, explanations that we've received from our speakers, but also from the manner in which they engaged one another. I am most sincerely grateful on behalf of the Murphy Institute and the University of St. Thomas. I want to thank all of you for your participation in this discussion, and I want to thank especially our two speakers for the, the care and the thought that they put into their presentations and the advocacy that they do for their sides. So thank you all very much. Thank you very Goodbye. much. Goodbye.